Hi, everyone. Welcome to 10 Minute University Noontime Chat. Today's class is number 19 of our 2021 webinar series. All of the previous classes were recorded and posted at the website that's shown on your screen, cmastergardeners.org. When you visit a site, simply click the 10 Minute University tab and it will take you to our more than 50 handouts and all the videos. You may know Oregon State University owns this trademark and Clackamas County Master Gardeners develop and manage the program. We're so happy you're joining us today and allow us to be part of your gardening success. Here are the resources from which I base my presentation today. There are many, all of which are from university extension publications. As you know, these publications draw from research-based information, but they're written for the general public. I find them very, very helpful, and I encourage you to explore all of them as appropriate. This information is in the chat box and it will be repeated again uh, throughout the presentation in the slides. The one, present, uh, one publication of those five from Oregon State, EM9289, with the title Enhancing Urban and Suburban Landscapes to Protect the Pollinators is one that I'm going to draw heavily from for today's presentation. This is the publication where the garden designs are incorporated. And if that's what you're interested in, you definitely want to download it and have it handy. And I have three objectives for uh, th this presentation today. The first one is that you will become familiar with these OSU recommended garden designs for pollinators. The second one is that you will know how to adjust each design to suit your space and interest. And finally, I hope you will take away at least three ideas for enhancing your own garden in benefit of pollinators. So rather than waiting until later, I'm going to give you a preview of the 10 proven ideas, and here they are. Number one, leave some garden soil bare as habitat for soil nesting native bees, which account for 70% of all bees. Number two, add one clump of pollinator plant. When it comes to flowers to feed pollinators, size matters. And I'm going to say a lot more about that. Number three, grow a variety of plants for a long season of bloom. We know from research that bees emerge over a long season, some species early, some species late. In order to benefit more species, it is important for us to provide flowers over a long season, spring through fall. Number four, choose fewer petals. The horticultural trade continues to provide eye candies for us with flowers, with more petals and fancier petals. And that often comes at the expense of pollen production. Again, I will say a little more about that later. Number five, feed hummingbirds with plants. We know certain plants attract hummingbirds and serve them. Put those plants in your garden and hummingbirds will visit. Number six, use hummingbird feeders. Research shows even when flowers are abundant, hummingbirds do use feeders to supplement. 
And for people living in the Pacific Northwest, where the Anna's hummingbirds overwinter, that type of feeding is even more important. Number seven, make a butterfly puddle. Butterflies need minerals. And in areas that are summer dry, like in the Pacific Northwest, it is very difficult to find minerals. So a butterfly puddle is a simple solution to serve them and enhance the enjoyment of your garden. Number eight, plant natives. We know from research, native bees uh, are uh, more attracted to native plants, native flowers. And uh, so natives can be incorporated into the garden in order to diversify your offering to a variety of pollinators. And number one through eight are ideas that will work very well in a garden um, of a small size. And if you have more room available, consider number nine and 10, plant a shrub and plant a tree. And I'm going to be drawing ideas from these OSU garden designs and provide some examples of trees and shrubs that would be particularly good for pollinators. So this is what the designs look like. In the publication EM9289 from OSU, there are four ready-made garden designs. And um, they're done by Signe Danler, who is with the Oregon State University Garden Ecology Lab. And she is also a garden designer. Each design uses a similar approach. For example, it covers 60 feet by 25 feet space. It incorporates a variety of plants from trees, shrubs, to perennials, annuals, and bulbs. And it's designed primarily for viewing from the front and side with the taller plants framing the back. Each design also has a ground nesting bee habitat near the center. And to the left of the bee nesting area are plants that need less soil moisture. And it's denoted in the design as the dry end. And to the right of the bee habitat are plants that need greater soil moisture is shown as the wet end. And um, each design has a focus. For example, this one is a native plant garden. So all the plants are native to the Pacific Northwest. And uh, the garden designs the first three, native plant, native non-native, and low maintenance are also designed for gardens that are located west of the Cascades, uh, primarily Oregon and Washington. So this is the second garden design using native and non-native plants. Again, west of the Cascades, you can see it's the same size with taller trees and shrubs framing the back, progressively moving toward the foreground with shorter plants, incorporating a variety of types of plants and uh, with the native bee habitat in the center, the drier, soil to the left and the wetter soil to the right. A third design is a low maintenance garden. And of course, that means the plant choices require uh, very little work. We can see the same parameters repeated here. And um, at this point, I should mention these color renderings are composites of spring through fall, the three seasons of color. And that's probably why each rendering is so colorful. Now, obviously, some of these blooms happen during the spring and summer and fall, different seasons of the year. 
So to have a more accurate idea of how each garden will look, you can also get something that's labeled as supplemental files when you go to download the main publication. And it will take you to the per season color rendering. For example, this is the low maintenance gar garden in early spring. See where we get color from the Western red bud and the tall Oregon grape and camas. And later on, late spring through summer, we get color from California lilac, Ceanothus, Hawthorne, and a number of the perennials begin to pick up the slack. And then late summer through fall, the trees and shrubs have given us a green background and yet a different group of perennials and, and subshrubs are picking up the color. So I find these uh, per season color rendering very helpful, especially when uh, I have gone through the process to zero in on a particular design. We've looked at three gardens designs so far, and all of them are for west of the Cascades. There is one, the fourth one, for central and southern Oregon. Here, plant choices are quite different because we gardeners know the climate conditions for those areas of the state vary quite a bit from the valley and the coast. So here we begin to see some of the plants that we have not seen in previous designs. For example, golden currant, green rabbit brush, green leaf manzanita, which are really not what we would grow in the valley. But we also see some of the other similar plants used, for example, tall Oregon grape. And just as a quick reminder, Western Oregon um, are in USDA zone eight and above. And that is a measure of the average winter low temperature. So zone eight would mean the average low temperature would be zero or above Fahrenheit. Compare that to say Bend, other parts of central Oregon, clearly zone six or seven would have much lower winter temperature. So plants choices for outside of the valley would need to be much more cold hardy. Now that's not the only major difference. Another difference would be the summer heat. And um, the map on the right shows the heat zone. And that is developed by the American Horticulture Society by counting the number of days in a year when the high temperature exceeds 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And we don't need to go into any details to notice the colors for the valley and coast are quite different from central and southern Oregon. And that's because the number of hot days exceeding 86 degrees vary significantly. With each design comes a lot of information about the plants. So I'm using the low maintenance garden design as an example. And it has a list of all the plants used, beginning with a common name and um, scientific name. And they're organized into early bloomers, late spring through summer bloomers, and then late bloomers. And in addition, we get information about which pollinators are most attracted to each plant. We also get the cultural requirements such as need for soil moisture, sun or shade. And in addition, they tell us the flower color and the month when the flower blooms. 
I think this is simply fantastic. So as you can see, normally when we design a garden or think about uh, making changes and adding new plants, we have to think about a lot of things. And these OSU designs already have done the work and figure out pretty much what we normally have to do in our own research. And they're just leaving a little bit for us to figure out. So this may be really wonderful. The trouble could be you don't have the space. You don't have a 60 by 25 feet open space in your garden ready for one of these designs to be plopped in there. Then what do you do? How do you take these ideas and work them into a different size garden, different setting, perhaps it's already established, somewhat mature, and you're going to make uh, some changes to enhance the value for pollinators. So I have come up with 10 ideas which would help you use these design information and incorporate them into an existing gar garden. And needless to say, you can use one, two, any combinations of them as you see fit. So the first idea is leave some soil bare. This may be a crazy one for gardeners. Not planting anything, just leave the soil bare, not even putting organic mulch on it. And if you really need to, or really want to, you can use some decorative rocks and pebbles. And that's because 70% of native bees nest underground. When we cover the soil with leaves and rocks and uh, compost and other kinds of mulch materials, they're not able to tunnel under. So leaving the soil bare is providing habitat for native soil nesting bees. Number two, add one clump of pollinator plant. Here are a few things we know. We used to say you should grow flowering plants in large clumps of three foot diameter. That's because we know butterflies are nearsighted and large clumps of flowers are easier to find for them and also allow for energy efficient foraging by bees, by other pollinators. Recent research, fairly new information coming out of Michigan indicate that if you have large clumps of 30 square feet, and that's about five and a half feet uh, on each side, a square. The diversity of native bees really increase significantly. So keep these sizes in mind uh, and, and see what's doable in your garden. Now, the large clump is important for butterflies and bees, but if you're attracting and feeding hummingbirds, keep those plants apart because hummingbirds are extremely territorial and a large clump simply is going to create more competition. I've included some examples of plants that may be suitable for a large clump of pollinator plant to be added. And there's no need to write down any name because all of these names are already in the handout that you have from OSU. They're just taken from each design as examples. And I want to show you some examples by looking at the photos. Uh, Goldenrod and Douglas Astor are pretty common native plants, which have been proven to be uh, in the most attractive to native bee group in a recent Oregon State Garden Ecology Lab study. They do need some summer moisture to look best and flower longer season. Now, if you have an even hotter and drier spot, uh, balsam root and Rocky Mountain bee plant would be good candidates. 
and these are examples that are non-native, ranging from fairly short um, alyssum to tall Mexican sunflower. As you can see, they come in many color and size and shape. So there's no shortage of choices in terms of good uh, pollinator plant to be added to your garden. And of course, I think everybody knows that borage and calendula also offer edible petals that can dress up our salads in addition to feeding the pollinators. Okay, number three, grow a variety of flowers and the varieties are in flower shape and bloom time. I mentioned earlier, it's important to provide a long season of flowers and that's because native bees emerge at different times of the year. This is some species emerge early and some species emerge middle season and late season. And that's probably because that they have evolved to emerge at times when the native flowers or their food source are available. In addition, we know late summer food supply is critical to bumblebees being able to produce a new queen who will then carry on or uh, start a new colony the next season. So providing a long season of flowers is key to our ability to serve a variety of pollinators. In addition, we know the shape of flowers uh, determine what kind of bees would feed from it. In fact, UC Berkeley Bee Lab recommend 20 plant types minimum for a good pollinator garden. This is all at once. This is for the entire season, early through, through late, uh, 20 total. So here again are some examples from these four OSU garden designs. I've listed examples from the native garden, the low maintenance garden, non-native and hot and dry uh, garden for suitable for Southern and Central Oregon. And in fact, some of those plant choices for the Southern and Central Oregon gardens could work in the valley and coast if you have the right microclimate and soil. Um, so if you have a hot and dry spot in a garden in the valley, some of these plant choices would thrive as well. Again, no shortage of plants and no need to write down any information because it's all in the, in the handout. So here are some examples from the low maintenance design. Um, I just picked out a few perennial plants and you can see even in this small sample, they have different leaf shapes, different flower shapes and uh, different plant shapes overall and can make pretty interesting combinations, monochromatic and high contrast, you take your pick. And if you have a, a at hot and dry spot, this is from the design for the Southern and Central Oregon. These are some examples of plants that will do well. And I mentioned earlier, some of them in fact do well in gardens uh, in west of the Cascades. And uh, just in this picture, the, in this screen of the five pictures, some are early bloomer, some are mid-season and late bloomer. For example, sedum and uh, Oregon checker mellow bloom early, uh, oh, and Oregon sunshine. And uh, prairie wine cup is a mid-season bloomer and the green rabbit brush is a late season bloomer. So it's really not difficult to come up with a variety and combination that will provide flower resources for a long season. And if you don't have enough soil space, but you have part of the driveway, um, a sidewalk, uh, deck, some other space where you could use containers, here's another possibility. I find it easy to use different size containers and plants and keep it to one 
type of plant per container. And then I simply use blocks, bricks, and other structures available to organize and arrange to create drama. And when the blooms are done, simply move them off to the side and bring in something new. And that's a pretty simple way to keep up uh, a show for a long season. All right, number four, choose fewer petals. I mentioned earlier that a horticultural trade uh, is um, always endeavoring to produce more interesting flowers. And often those are more petals and more fancier petals. And that comes at the expense of pollen production. So when you look at these two pictures of large flower tick seed, this Coreopsis grandiflora, the variety on the left, far fewer petals. The one on the right, many more and more interesting um, edge. A bee trying to forage would have a much easier time getting to the pollen and nectar by landing on the flower on the left, while the complex flower creates a lot more barrier to get to. And in addition, those more petals happens because the center, the stamen production is reduced. So if you garden with a priority for feeding pollinators, then you would want to choose flowers that are simpler, fewer petals. And something else to keep in mind is the cut flower trade has created um, a need to breed flowers that have no pollen at all. So they don't make a mess in a flower arrangement. Uh, sunflower is one example. So if you're growing sunflowers for pollinators, then you would want to select the varieties that are open pollinated. Number five, feed hummingbirds with plants. These OSU designs use a number of plants to feed hummingbirds. And I've shown some examples here on the page. Uh, we know hummingbirds are the most prominent bird pollinators in North America. And this is because they have very long beak and tongue and they reach very deeply into the flower to drink the nectar. And in that process, they pick up pollen with their beak and feathers and transfer it. So in addition to these examples from the designs, there is a separate OSU publication on attracting hummingbirds to your garden, and it offers many more plant ideas. And in general, we know hummingbirds like flowers that have a trumpet shape, rich in nectar and have bright colors. And here are some examples that I've grown in my garden. And this year I've added three salvia hot lips because they're so easy to grow. And it's some in the ground, some in containers to keep them in different parts of the garden to lessen the competition among the hummingbirds. And um, I have to say, this is a simple way to add so much excitement and motion in the garden. I hope everybody will try it. Oh, one other, uh, one other caution, trumpet vine. This is a fantastic hummingbird plant, but it should be grown if you only have a sturdy support structure uh, to sustain it. Okay, number six, use hummingbird feeders. We know hummingbirds, even when flowers are abundant, they use feeders to supplement the natural nectar. And in addition, 30 years of data collected by Project Feeder Watch has shown us that feeding during the winter is responsible for expansion of the winter range of Anna's hummingbird. So if you live in the areas that are shown in pink on the map, it's important to keep up winter feeding in order to sustain Anna's uh, during that season. And if you do feed hummingbirds, here are some tips on how to do it properly. The nectar should be a quarter cup sugar per cup of water. 
and that's during the regular uh, temperature. And during the really cold season, up it to one third cup of sugar per cup of water. And be sure to only use table sugar and no red dye. Instead, use a, use a feeder that has red color. And um, it's best to just have enough for that will last one to two days to stay fresh. And uh, there should be a bee guard, it's a mesh, to keep the bees from entering. And I've mentioned earlier, hummingbirds are territorial, so it's important uh, to have more smaller feeders positioned in different parts of the garden as opposed to one giant feeder uh, for them to fight it out. And uh, keeping the feeder out of direct sun will keep the the sugar water lasts longer. Number seven, make a butterfly puddle. Now we know butterflies need mineral. You might have noticed uh, butterflies, seems like they're sucking off of wet soil or off of the ground uh, during the wet season. And sometimes you might have seen them do that um, fresh animal dung. Uh, that's how they get minerals. In the summer season when butterflies are active, especially in the Pacific Northwest where we have a dry summer, um, it's difficult sometimes to find moisture or moist soil to get the minerals. So a butterfly puddle is a good way to help them and to bring some um, activity and interest to your garden. So all you need is a big shallow saucer. Uh, the bigger, the longer it will last, it will not evaporate as quickly. Sand, composted manure, and some water. And the steps are pretty simple. You just fill the saucer with sand. You add, uh, this saucer here is about uh, 20 inch diameter. So you add two tablespoons of manure, you mix it with the sand, smooth the surface, and create a slight indent. And then you add water until it pools at the surface. And just monitor it, add more water as needed to keep up the moisture. And um, when, uh, uh, and when it's time to change, dump everything on a monthly basis, dump everything and refresh it with new sand and compost. There is a University of Georgia video, which uh, I believe is put in your chat link. And uh, it's, a, it's a brief video that takes you through the step-by-step. -step. Number eight, plant natives. We know from research, most recently from University, University of California's Urban Bee Lab and OSU's Garden Ecology Lab, that native bees preferred native plants. If you are new to native plants, uh, consider using some annuals. They're easy to get started. They don't take a whole lot of space and you're only making a commitment for one season. And you have the choice of using seeds or small plants. But if you are already familiar with native plants, then uh, these designs offer a lot of choices for bigger plants, including shrubs and trees. So if we're just trying some native annuals from the native garden design, here are some of the natives used uh, in that design. And rather than looking at the names here, let's go on to the next one. So we're looking at their names and their images. I think they're quite attractive. So some of these are early season. The Douglas meadow foam is an early season bloomer. And uh, the showy tarweed, uh, Mattia elegans, is a late season bloomer. And everything else is uh, a late spring through summer bloomer. So there is a range in bloom time and uh, some variation in sizes. 
But the one thing I want to mention is Douglas metal foam is a pretty aggressive self sewer. So if you do use it, it's probably best to keep it to its own area because it can easily overwhelm everybody else. All right, number nine, plant a shrub. We know butterflies and moths need host plants to lay eggs and to feed the caterpillars. And we know many of the shrubs and trees serve as host plants for them. And of course, those that bloom also produce so many flowers to feed bees, hummingbirds, and butterflies. So these are four examples from the native garden design from OSU. And um, I've used small icons to indicate their benefits. So you can see, um, for example, Indian plum benefit butterfly, serve as host plant for them, and bees and hummingbird. So each of these choices does many duties. And if you have an area that's hot and dry, these are plants uh, selected for the Southern and Central Oregon uh, design, but we all know that in our area, we can, in the Valley, we can also grow ocean spray and California lilac. Just make sure you put them in the proper microclimate. And again, uh, each of these choices offer many benefits. So this is where I wanna say something about the source of these photos. And that's OSU's landscape plants website. You just simply put it in to your search engine, landscape plants, Oregon State, and it will come up. And um, it's a really useful resource. What I like most is they show not just one picture of a plant uh, when it's in bloom and you have no idea what it looks like the rest of the year. They show so many images, close up of the flower, close up of the bark, um, what the plant looks like in spring, summer, fall, if there is fall color. They show uh, just you know what it looks like in nature, how it looks like in a landscaped environment, and it's really useful if you're doing research on um, shrubs and trees. All right, number 10, we've gotten to the end. Plant a tree. Instead of showing you a whole bunch of pictures of trees, I want to call your attention to two tables, lists of plants that are also in this publication, EM9289. The first table shows trees that are attractive to pollinators. And here's a list of 30 examples. Don't try to read it. Just know that it's in your handout. And I wanna point out about half of these are Northwest native. And the second thing is the major majority of them bloom in the spring. Look at that. Hardly anything bloom in the summer, at least from this list. All right, so going on. Here are just pictures of a few trees that can't stop myself. <laughs> uh, these images are also from the landscape plant website. It's just so much fun to look through it. So the bottom three, Cascara, Vine Maple, and Western Redbud are uh, Pacific Northwest natives, and the crab apple is not. And I'm sure you already know that. And now you can also see their pollinator benefit as indicated by the little icons. All right. So here is something I don't want you to read, but I do want to call your attention to it. And it's uh, a second table from the same handout with the title Problem Prone Trees and Shrubs. Well, the sad thing is when I look at this list, I find a whole bunch of things that I have in my garden. Well, not a whole bunch, some. All right, take, let's take a look at them. European white birch, boxwood, I have a boxwood. 
apple and crab apple, variety of fruit trees, rhododendron and azalea, I have rhododendron, rose, I have rose, common lilac, linden. Wow. Okay. So OSU is not telling us don't grow these plants, but they want us to make informed decisions. And of course, the thinking is if we avoid problem prone plants, we will reduce the need for pesticides. And what is the purpose of trying to do all kinds of good for pollinators, but at the same time also slap them in the back? Well, I just want to mention one thing. This last tree on this list is Telia, and that's Linden. Remember, we had a large bee kill incident in Wilsonville a few years back when an estimated 50,000 bees were killed. And that was because linden trees, this particular plant, were planted in a shopping center parking lot. And, and they are known to be susceptible to aphids and thrips that will feed on the leaves. And when they're feeding, they produce a sticky substance called honeydew, and that drips down from where they are. So the problem is when you put these trees with this known problem in the shopping center of heavy traffic, foot traffic, and cars, people are not going to like all the sticky stuff on their car. So the solution, not the correct solution, was uh, these trees were sprayed when they were in bloom and, um, and the pesticides were directly applied with all the bees right on the flowers. And that was the reason 50,000 bees were killed. So this is a way to, as an example to say, there are no bad plants per se, but right plant, right place. If you plant linden, put it in the place where the honeydew is not going to bother anyone and lead to use of pesticides. And in the handout called Attracting Pollinators, we, pro we provide you with this table, which gives you the general characteristics of flowers that are attractive to bees, butterflies, birds, and fly. Just in case you don't like the plants that are specified for each one of the OSU designs, and you want to look at options, these guidelines are particularly helpful. And there's another OSU publication called Create a Butterfly Garden. And it gives information about host plants, which is where the butterflies lay their eggs and the caterpillar as they hatch will feed on the leaves. Um, and the nectar plants, which is what the adult butter butterflies will feed on. If you're interested in particular in butterflies, this publication provides a lot of information for, to you, for you to explore further. All right, so at this point, I am going to stop sharing my PowerPoint and end the talk with with a uh, video If you want to attract bees to your garden, chances are you have consulted a plant list. Recent studies show that most plant lists were not developed based on science. 
This video will show you plants that have been proven by research to attract bees. We know pollinators use flowers for food. Butterflies and hummingbirds drink nectar, and bees need nectar and pollen. Some flowers are used by many kinds of pollinators, such as hummingbirds, beetles, and butterflies. When bees use these flowers, they face more competition. Yet other flowers are designed especially for bees. Good examples are flowers in pale to dark shades of purple and blue, and flowers in white with violet markings. This is because most bees see ultraviolet lights, so these colors and patterns really stand out. The best bee flowers allow bees to gather pollen and nectar with ease. Often, they are shaped to match a bee's body and flight pattern. Here are four types. Open platform flowers are arranged in the flat top or globe. Pollen and nectar are exposed and easily accessible. Pollen bowl flowers have a bowl or bell shape and is rich in pollen. Buzz adapted flowers, including tomatoes, lock in the pollen until they're buzzed by bees. Finally, plants with flowers arranged on stalks, spikes, all in close proximity, so a bee can go from flower to flower with the least amount of energy. Dr. Gordon Frankie of University of California studied bees and flowers over decades. His work can cover plants that are proven to attract bees. Here are some examples you can find in local nurseries. California bees and plants overlap a great deal with those of Oregon, so Dr. Frankie's work is informative to us. Also useful is a local project at the Oregon State University North Willamette Research and Extension Center. Three years ago, Erin Anderson, a PhD student of the OSU Garden Ecology Lab, began to study native plants' ability to attract bees. This is the field where Erin put in 27 kinds of plants. 23 are Oregon natives. He counts bee visits to determine how attractive each plant is. The first two years show six native plants, Globigilia, California poppy, Douglas aster, goldenrod, Facilia, and Clarkia to be the best for attracting native bees. Oregano, a non-native, is best for attracting honeybees. In addition to planting the best bee flowers, other important gardening practices for a successful bee garden are provide a long season of bloom by planting a variety of flowers that bloom spring through fall, enable energy efficient foraging by planting flowers in large clumps, use easy to find flowers by planting in the sun and using blue purple flowers or white flowers with violet markings. Prolong bloom period by watering plants and removing spent flowers. Offer nesting areas by leaving patches of bare soil for 70% of all native bees that nest underground. And by leaving stumps, brush piles, hollow plant stems in the garden for those that nest above ground. Practice integrated pest management by figuring out the problem before taking action. Plant disease resistant varieties, monitor regularly, 
Remove pest and diseased parts promptly. Apply pesticides as a last resort and follow the instructions on label. So this concludes the presentation and um, let's see, do we have questions? Hi, Leah. Hi, Sherry. Um, we have one question that I'd like to talk about and, it and I want to bring it up. Somebody asked it and when I was telling people about this wonderful butterfly feeder, the response I kept getting was manure. I've got to have manure. And so the question was, is there anything besides well composted manure that's more easily accessible that we can use for the butterfly feeder? Do you know, do you have that answer? I'm, I'm not aware of any, the instructions I've seen use uh, compost. So it could be chicken manure, steer manure, the stuff that you can buy in bags, which we use as organic fertilizer. Okay. And one thing I should mention is I think the concern about manure is more of a human centric interpretation of what it is. <laughs> now, uh, I have traveled in many different places of the world and seen fresh dung, uh, whether it's from elephants or you know horses, uh, cow, a variety of places and see huge numbers of butterfly sitting on the dung and just won't leave. They'll sit on it and seem to be doing something and then they will you know, fly away and then they'll come back and do more. And the first time I saw this, I thought, what are they doing? What is so attractive? Mm -hmm. And when I was reading about how to attract butterflies and the butterfly, butterfly puddle, I got the answer, of course. And so I would say, you know, composted manure, the stuff that you can buy in a bag is just uh, really, it's probably the most sanitary mm -hmm. uh, approach to it. Um, rather so than finding, <laughs> rather than going out and finding elephant poop, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, or, you know, or, uh, yeah, and that's why the instruction from University of Georgia says specifically composted manure. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously fresh manure works, but we're trying to sanitize everything, uh, you know, in terms of gardening practices. Yeah. Okay. And I noticed that somebody was uh, asking about all of these links. And I just want to mention when you get your follow up email tomorrow, all the links will be in there. So look for them. In addition to a link to the recording. Yeah, perfect. That would be great. That's good information. Thank you. <laughs> That's the only question that we have that I haven't really kind of answered while you were talking. Um, so I think that I think that's 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 terrific. I, I just want to say that um, it's wonderful that so many people are interested in doing something in the garden to help benefit pollinators and really it's easy to get started because if nothing else i hope this program shows that there are so many ways to do it you can go big you can go small you can go complex you can go simple but the important thing is get going do something uh, and there's no shortage of ideas no shortage of plant choices and no shortage of pollinator that we can help Years ago, somebody, uh, a neighbor, has this lawn that's not very well kept, lots of kind of exposed, you know, soil spots and um, not mow regularly, just looked really awful. And it has all these dandelions blooming in it. And it's sort of like a neighborhood eyesore. And when I started doing the pollinator class, I told my neighbor, don't even bother to fix your lawn just make a sign that says pollinator habitat <laughs> and stick it in your lawn. That's because I was working with people from the Xerces Society 
and um, you know to get some photos of variety of soil nesting bees. Mm -hmm. And this one one photo they sent me was a mining bee, which is a soil nesting soil tunneling bee, mm -hmm. at the entrance to her nest underground. And you can see on her legs, there are these pollen packed on the hind leg. So you know she is ready to go in there, mm -hmm. make a bee bread with the pollen and nectar, and then lay an egg on it. Mm -hmm. and, and then where is the entrance to this tunnel? In a really bad patch of lawn, <laughs> in the bare soil spot. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is it. I'm going to have to share this with my neighbor and encourage him not to do anything to beautify it because, you know, forget about watering and mowing and fertilizing. Just leave it alone and make it as a native bee habitat. I think that that uh, addresses one of the other questions that, that I talked about while you were um, speaking was, does the, does the soil have to be compacted or should it be loosened up to make it easier for the bees? And in my yard, I know that I have the ground nesting bees in the just nastiest hard clay. <laughs> and you know, there's just all these little holes and that's yeah. what they're from. Yeah. yeah, I used to see these little holes and I think they're ants, but uh -huh. they're not. They're actually soil nesting bees. So this is the area of study that is most lacking in native bees. Mm -hmm. There's just not much known about their nesting behavior and soil needs, et cetera. So all we know is there are different species of bees that are able to use different types of soil. Some specialize in using very sandy, loose soil, and some specialize in using um, clay soil. So they have adapted to be able to tunnel in those types of soil substrate that they manage to use. And they have different provisions for dealing with, for example, sealing the tunnel. So to make it kind of waterproof. Mm -hmm. And um, it's fascinating where there is some information. It's just a really curious and amazing world. But unfortunately, there is very little known about it. So I would say in a home garden, it's pretty much believing if you build it, they will come. So in this instance, <laughs> it's not building anything. It's just leaving bare soil yeah. um, alone and observe and see what happens. And I think it's just the most marvelous and exciting thing that a bare patch of soil can be inhabited by some marvelous creatures. Yeah, that's great. Oh, hang on. I've got several more Q&As that just popped up. So let me go through. Um, uh, so a, you list tall Oregon grape quite a bit. What about the shorter variety? Would that work as well? Uh, yes, but the tall ones will have more flowers. Yeah. And, um, and I think the reason why the tall ones are specified for these design, I should clarify, I only use plants that are used in those four OSU designs. I did not come up with my favorite plants and add them uh, mm -hmm. to this presentation, just to say true. And uh, so the shorter ones, yes, they will. But I think the garden designer, Signe Dandler, chose the tall ones in this instance because in the design, their size fit better in terms of the contrast going against the trees and as a bridge to where the shorter uh, perennials and annuals. Um. One of the things, just right on what we were talking about, she says, I have a messy, ugly lawn and there are bees everywhere. <laughs> do you think bees use the mole mounds? You know? Um, <laughs> I, I do. I, th I yeah. think if, you, if you're not afraid, because, you know, as you know, native bees really are not aggressive unless if you're really in their face, they are, you know, they leave you alone if you reasonably leave them alone. So I would say that, you know, pay some attention, observe and see what's going on and what you can spot in terms of bees. I mean, I've learned to pay attention to bees in my garden by approaching them slowly and making sure that I'm not casting shadow over them because that startled them and get them to 
not uh, go away. Mm -hmm. And so there are things to do in observing them. And, you know, you might consider using binoculars. So you're not having to, you know, get that close. It kind of depends on your vision and your abilities and the setting of your garden. But it's so much fun to see those activities in the garden and sometimes at a much smaller scale yeah. than we pay attention to. Um, you know, it, it wasn't until I was reading about hummingbirds and hummingbirds say um, that hummingbirds, we think about them as drinking nectar. And the one thing that I never thought much about is the fact that they need protein as well. They're not just eating junk food all day, drinking sugar water. And how do they get their protein? By eating the spiders and uh, um, other insects that they can find in our garden. Mm. So I'm beginning to pay more attention to what are these hummingbirds doing, you know, in the garden. Yeah. And another thing I was talking about using pesticides is often the things we do in the garden can indirectly affect garden visitors, mm. different forms of wildlife that we don't think about. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm careful not to use pesticides because I'd rather live with a ugly looking leaf or just pull it off my rose instead of, you know, having pretty rose leaves, but uh, potentially affecting um, other critters because, you know, I see the rose in my roses, I see these crab spider quite often on the flower. And if I'm using the pesticide on the rose, how do I know it's not going to go back and affect the hummingbird? And that's just not worth it for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone asked, are roadies useful at all? I thought they were native. We have a lot planted by previous owner in a forested environment. I will address a little bit of it. I have um, a lot of roadies that were left by the woman who planted this house originally. And the bees, the bumbles, absolutely adore rhododendron flowers. I mean, you can hear, I've got a massive one that you can hear from 20 feet away, the bees buzzing. Um, and of course, we do have native rhododendrons, but that's not usually what you find at the garden centers. Yeah, rhodes, I mean, rhodes have flowers that provide the, the pollen and nectar for pollinators, bees, birds, etc. And I've not seen hummingbirds feed on them because they don't have the correct flower shape. But I know a variety of bees do feed off of rhododendron flowers. Mm -hmm. And especially the ones that bloom early in the season, you know, they are used by a lot of the, the native bees. The other thing I want to mention about the uh, rhodes is it's on that list that says problem prone <laughs> plants. And because we know it's in within the last what six years or so that we're having these these uh, rhododendron bugs and uh, azalea, the leaf bugs, have come in to attack them. So these new pests have created a problem for plants that otherwise are wonderful and of a great deal of uh, wildlife and um, pollinator benefit if we're not able to manage. The, the disease or the pest without using chemicals that may be injurious to the pollinators that we want to help. Mm -hmm. So that's where the trade-off comes in. Um, but I would say that if and natives, and they do look good in the landscape, so if they're not uh, disease prone and they look healthy and they're providing the flowers, um, I would say leave them. But if you have a better use, and replace them with something else that's a wonderful native that have even greater benefits from uh, any one of these four designs, uh, you might consider that. Okay. Um, somebody says um, they're on a large acre and a half. They've got lots of flowers and bees and stuff, but um, they've got five in-ground hives uh, of yellow jackets oh. here and one in the shed, uh, that's too many to enjoy our yard, any suggestions? <laughs> so the recommendation from OSU is with um, yellow jackets and other you know, wasps, 
um, if they are not in the way, if you can tolerate their presence, allow them, leave them be, because they are uh, predators and they play a role in the ecosystem. But if they are in your way and there are an issue uh, or a concern for your health, then you know, obviously we're not encouraging you to coexist with them. So yeah. use your judgment. Okay. All right. I think that about covers it. Oh, pansies and nasturtiums. Do they attract bees? Pansies and nasturtiums. I don't know about their um, pollen and nectar uh -huh. uh, content. And so, so I, so I can't say, but, right. you know, for plants that, that I'm not familiar with, I just watch just to see it, you know, who comes and yeah. how long do they stay? Oh, you know, something that uh, somebody had asked me at one point is, is there a competition between uh, honeybees and native bees? you know, in terms of, of floral resources. Yeah. And I think one thing that we we should know is if there are a lot more people who are keeping honeybees, and honeybees obviously use a lot of pollen and nectar because of their need to sustain the colony. And especially if humans are harvesting, removing that honey from the hives. Mm -hmm. While the native bees don't make honey, except for bumblebees, they make a little bit. Um, and so in general, they only take what they need in order to sustain the egg laid on it for the egg to go through the um, early life stages before it matures and become an adult bee. So the amount of resource needed by the native bees, relatively speaking, are lesser compared to honeybees just because they have different life history and behavior. So knowing that um, even though there are no outright wars, you know, like bumblebees fighting against the honeybees because we're all trying to feed off of this patch of flowers. When you think about it, if there is limited flower resources, five bees come to the same flower. The first one getting there and got pollen and nectar. The second one come in and there's less available. The third, the fourth, and perhaps by the fifth one, there's not much left or nothing left. So this is an indirect way to say, almost in the urban environment, in our home gardens, we cannot have too many flowers because there is probably a limit to what can be sustained. And if there is not enough, some of them are not going to do well. I mentioned that honeybee, I mean, bumblebees, if they don't get enough flowers, late season flowers, the colony will not get to the final generation of bees. And that's when the female and male come and the female is able to breed and the new queen will, will leave. And the colony is annual. So at the end of the summer, it all die, including the old queen. But the new queen is the hope for the next generation next year. And if that colony does not get enough to eat in late summer, there will not be that new generation. There will not be the new queen to carry on the population. So plant flowers, more flower is better, early season through late fall, as much as possible, and then spend time to enjoy your garden and see who comes to visit and get to know them. That's what I encourage everyone to do. So thank you so much for spending some time with us today. And thank you, Leah thank and uh, Priscilla. Okay, everyone, thanks for coming.